This was the year 1956. Baba was in strict seclusion, mind you. Baba let it be known that he was opening up a window, stepping out of seclusion for for a period of a few of a month in order to go and pay a visit to the west. In the meantime, I was working in an insurance company as I said. <coughs> Now the staff in our company was quite overworked and I had to work from morning till late in the night typing out policies so eventually it told on my health so my colleagues found me blanked out In June 1956, suffering from fatigue due to overwork in his job in Pune, Merwan Jesawala came to Merazad for a rest. Under Baba's orders, he was to take a complete rest, to do nothing but rest to regain his strength. When he arrived at Merazad, Erich, who was busy preparing for Baba's trip, handed his brother Merwan a folder full of written messages that Baba had previously dictated to Dr. Deshmukh. Eric asked Merwan to go through the folder of messages and select ones that he thought would be good for Baba to take and have read out in America and Australia. So then I started to look at it and the beautiful things that Baba had given out and I began to select passages and then I came to Eric and said Eric there's so much there I I don't know what I should leave out and it, it wouldn't be fair to for me to select it says do something now <coughs> I have no time select good passages that you feel like and start doing it don't keep coming and asking me things I have no time <laughs> so I said fine and then I began to mark out these passages which I felt were really very strong and very, very powerful and began to just make markings the process of getting bound and then unbound is charged with immense significance the soul gets mixed up with the body and then gets caught up with it the soul is like a parrot and the body is like a cage when the parrot is outside of the cage it is free 
but it does not fully appreciate what freedom is. Not having known confinement, it does not recognize being outside of the cage as freedom. When it goes through encagement, the agonizing bondage causes it to appreciate what freedom really is. Then, when the parrot is set free again, it truly enjoys its freedom. The same thing happens to the soul when through the grace of the perfect master, it is freed from the limiting nightmare in which it believes itself to be nothing but its own encaging body. Then Eraj would come after a few days and said, Have you done something or not? There's not much time. So, don't just fool about. So I said, Yes, yes. I, so where, where, what have you typed? I said, I haven't typed anything. Said, Why? I said, I'm marking them out right now and then I'll type them out. It's fine, but get the job done quickly because we have to then edit them, get them corrected, type them out. So be quick about it. So I started to put all my time and energy in doing that, you know. And after I selected those passages, he says, now type them out on separate sheets of paper and give them to me. So I began to do the typing.
direct journey to God. Masses who try to attain the truth by following rites and rituals are, as it were, in the good strain, which is detained indefinitely at various stations. sincerely and devotedly meditate on God or dedicate their lives to the service of humanity are, as it were, in the ordinary train which stops at every station according to the timetable. Those who seek the company of the truth realized master and carry out his orders in full surrenderance and faith are, as it were, in a special train which will take them to the goal in the shortest possible time without halts at intermediate stations. When I started to type, in comes Baba into my room and says, Now what the heck are you doing there? <laughs> <laughs> Didn't I order you that you are not to do any, any serious work? What is all this, this is you are doing? Mm -hmm. So I had to tell him, Baba, this is what I am doing. So he says, Well, okay, but then don't tax yourself too much. Take it easy. I it's my order, don't exert. Baba would go away, the Neeraj would come. How, how, many, how many passages? <laughs> <laughs> so it was a tussle, you know. Baba ordering me to relax and Neeraj after me to hurry up, get, get things done. In Baba's work, it's always like that. Yeah. It's always a hurry. Everything had to be done quick and at the same time he would give such orders that you have to not do what you have been doing. So it's, it's a big, big hassle for people who have to follow his orders. Dynamic Freedom The unlimited freedom of the truth-realized person is the only real and full freedom. Only in such dynamic freedom flowing through a perfect master 
can the self as truth manifest itself? Thus expressing the divinized impressions of the universal mind. The divinized impressions are infinitely creative and efficient because they are infinitely submissive to the self. They release creative and divine action which is unlimited. But the ordinary binding impressions of the ego mind are unendingly aggressive to the self and seek their own fulfillment. They are thus infinitely limited in efficiency and creativity. Anyways, I was doing the typing and one day Baba comes in and I see, sees me typing again and just then I blanked out again and Baba was telling me and I wasn't responding much for a few seconds I would just blank out so then he says what's the matter with you I said Baba I had one of those blank spells well, you see, you are not obeying me and this is the result. Did I not tell you not to, not to exert too much? Why are you doing this? Why aren't you obeying me? I said, Baba, Eraj wants them fast. Are you going to obey me or not? Now go and call Gustaji. <laughs> The Law of Karma All things are governed by laws of one kind or another. Even insignificant business concerns and public institutions have their laws and cannot function without them. This is even more true of the universe. It may seem sometimes as if the universe were not subject to any self-justifying law. And sometimes it appears as if sincere toil were lost, the virtuous condemned to suffering, and the vicious endowed with power and success. But this fractional and false view is derived from man's ignorance of the law of karma. When the ego mind refuses to understand life and encounters accumulated prejudices and resistance, it loses its equilibrium and tranquility. It is thus impelled either to release or inhibit good or bad actions, getting further involved in the results of its own activities, whether in the form of thoughts or deeds. The law of karma prevents the ego mind from escaping the results created by its own good or bad actions. The ego mind is harnessed by the gathered momentum of past actions and is incapable of emancipation or true balance because it is constantly disturbed, 
not only by environmental knocks and impacts, but also by the goadings of its own stored impressions. Although the ego mind has an inherent tendency to keep restoring its lost equilibrium, it attempts such restoration through a mechanical reaction of going over to the opposite and clinging to that, until it discerns through experience that balance is not to be gained in such clinging either. So the ego mind goes from opposite to opposite in the illusory karmic pendulum until, through endless testing and suffering, it runs its course of opposite actions and reactions, or until it has the good fortune to contact a perfect master and receive his grace. So I went and called Gustadji and Baba said, now bless Merwan that he shouldn't have these spells again. So Gustadji, I, I put my head down there and Gustadji put his hand on my head and he was observing silence so it was a gesture of blessing in silence and now Baba says, now that he has blessed you, you will be all right. But give him something in return for all the work that he has done. <laughs> so he noticed, noticed a piece of cheese that Najamai would send me specially for me at breakfast. So Baba says, give him that cheese. He likes cheese very much. <laughs> so I gave him that block of cheese and Gustaji was delighted. mind, which is subject to dispositional and impressional determinism, seeks and creates an overpowering false world, becomes enmeshed in it, and projects into it a false value that must, in the end, due to its very nature, betray itself. Mind divides a reality which is essentially indivisible. It clings to a form which is essentially perishable. It glorifies itself in actions which are essentially binding and in achievements which are essentially insignificant. It enjoys and suffers against the background of vacuity, thus depriving itself of any real happiness or understanding. The only way to live in the sanity of undiluted understanding is to become aware of this impressional determinism of the ego mind and to become free of its vitiating constraint. Then Baba says, now do the work, but don't, don't strain too much. You follow? I said, yes, Baba. 
and then he left and I had to start doing it there she comes again and says come on now <laughs> so eventually I got all these things typed out fortunately there were no further episodes with me and I could finish typing out all that I had marked out and when that was done uh, Eraj, I gave them the give the bunch to Eraj and he I said just have a look how how do you feel about it oh, he says it I'll see it don't worry and then he he, he collected all of them and uh, he began to read them to Baba. The act of the perfect master is not repetitive. It is not merely the redoing of something previously experienced in the context of a new setting. It is the doing of something that cannot be done within the restrictions of the experiences of duality. It is a creation of the utterly new. is infinite. The redeeming act of a perfect master is a flash of the eternal in the midst of what is nothing but rigidly determined causation. This is the mystery of divine grace bestowed by the perfect master. And Baba seemed to like them very much. He said, they are fine. So Baba said, send them to money for editing. So those the bunch of messages were sent to money for corrections and a little editing of the language because as you know uh, Deshmukh's language was a little on bombastic and on the high side so it ne needed to be simplified and put in proper English you know that, that, that was old time English he was a professor of philosophy and he had these high sounding words there. So Mani was doing the editing. Intuition has been buried under the debris from the piecemeal tuition of the assailing experiences of the false. Tuition is impressed from without, while intuition dawns from within. Therefore, 
The tutoring of the mind by external events has to be counteracted by inner awakening. Then and only then can intuition in its transcendent understanding truly judge without yielding to the stupor of indiscriminate impressibility. Look at your own shadow. It seems so near to you. It is adjoining you, but you cannot grasp it, nor overtake it in a race. You may chase your shadow till doomsday, but it will still evade you and remain a bit ahead of you. Seeking God through the ego mind is like trying to overtake your own shadow. It cannot be done. Not because God is in any way far off, but because you can never get the real through the false. The real is gained only when the false is given up. God is nearer to you than your own shadow. In fact, he is not only within you, but he is your very self. You cannot get at him, for you seek him through the ego mind, which converts him into the will o' the wisp. ego mind must meet actual death if God is to be seen and realized. After all, it was all edited and then the edited versions would come over to us and Erich and I would read those. So I particularly remember one message about the harnessing of steam, the power of steam. There's one discourse, uh, one little discourse in that book. Baba describes how steam has to be properly harnessed so that it could produce power. Otherwise, it could just go waste, yeah. So Mani had edited that so much that there was no flavor left in the whole thing. So 
we re-edited the whole thing and put back all the all the juicy way Baba described it. And you'll find that that's the message that was selected by the reviewer. What is his name? I forget now. Evans Wentz. Ah, Evans Wentz. He liked that message the most that we had re-edited. The energy which is expended in mere thinking, talking or writing is like the steam which escapes through the whistle of the railway engine. The whistle makes a noise and is even interesting, but it cannot drive the engine. amount of whistling can move the engine forward. The steam has to be harnessed and used intelligently in order that it may actually take the engine to its destination. That is why the sages have always insisted on practice rather than theory. This applies particularly to those who want to know and realize God. After all that was done, the re-editing and finalizing, it was read to Baba. Baba was happy. And then he said, get titles put upon them, all Deshmukh. He's the one who did it. So he'll put the titles on, on these. So De Deshmukh was sent an urgent telegram to come over and start typing the little headings on each of these sayings. So Deshmukh was here and he was typing away uh, uh, the, the, the headings to the, to the messages. Philosophers, atheists and others may affirm or refute the existence of God. But as long as they do not deny the very existence of their own being, they continue to testify to their belief in God. For I tell you with divine authority that God is existence, eternal and infinite. He is everything. Whether man knows it or not, there is for him only one aim in life and eventually he realizes this when he consciously experiences his own eternal and infinite state of I am God.
and then these messages got ready and then <coughs> when baba left uh, with the with the group these were taken and baba went to the west and he would ask keraj to read out these mess one message at a time at on different occasions In July of 1956 at Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, a television journalist from NBC interviewed Baba. The message entitled Labor of Love was Baba's response to the following question posed by the reporter. Why should misery perpetually exist on earth in spite of God's infinite love and mercy? The source of eternal bliss is the self in all. The cause of perpetual misery is the selfishness of all. satisfaction is derived through selfish pursuits misery will always exist only because of the infinite love and mercy of god can man learn to realize through the lessons of misery on earth that inherent in him is the source of infinite bliss and all suffering is his labor of love to unveil his own infinite self God being infinitely infinite and indivisible nothing can exist without him and outside of him hence unknown to you god is also in your i amness of duality since god is in you and you are in god where can the gross subtle and mental spheres exist but in your own existence Just as consciousness remains latent in a man sleeping soundly, full consciousness remains latent in the soul. At first, it begins to manifest or evolve through flickering dreams, sound asleep and awakening, and successive experiences in the mineral, vegetable, and animal kingdoms of the gross sphere, until it reaches the stage of man, where consciousness is full and complete. 
Though consciousness is fully manifested in man, it remains wedged between the necessary opposite experiences of duality. Knowingly or unknowingly, man is always trying to free it in order to be able to direct it towards his own true self. Be it minute, little, more or full, be it gross, subtle, mental or of the self, the soul's consciousness is the beginning and the end in a beginningless and endless panorama of God's infinitude. And through it you realize your own infinite power, immeasurable knowledge, and unfathomable bliss. During the tour, Ivy Dewsford was there and she liked those messages so much that she requested Baba, Baba can I have these printed, these are such beautiful messages, I would like them to be published. So Baba says, fine, take these and get them published. So that's how she got all those messages all together and got them properly published, reviewed and all the titles and that's the book Life at its Best. The Final Account When the goal of life is attained, one achieves the reparation of all wrongs, the healing of all wounds, the righting of all failures, the sweetening of all sufferings, relaxation of all strivings, the harmonizing of all strife, the unraveling of all enigmas, and the real and full meaning of all life.